has been uh, a great weekend here at Vertical. The ladies are all here for their conference on Friday night and Saturday, and I've heard so many great reports of what God is doing and has done in the lives of uh, the women here. I'm grateful for Roseanne and the team of ladies that uh, helped put all that together. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, all the leaders. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. I know it, it's a sacrifice to give up, but you made a difference this weekend in the lives of women and uh, who need encouragement and hope, and I, I know they got that this weekend. You know, when you read the scripture, it's pretty evident from what we find there that when God wants to do a work in a group, he starts with one. God chooses one, and then he'll work in that one's life. He'll call them, he'll bless them, he'll direct them, and if they'll listen, he'll even continue that process to correct them and keep them in a spirit of humility before him. And he'll use that one to change the world. It happens in a marriage that way. When God wants to do a work in a marriage, he starts with one. When God wants to do a work in a family, he'll choose one and he'll begin the work. When God wants to do a work in a group of people, he'll start with one. That's why you should never ignore that call that comes to your heart. That sense of calling and direction and hearing God speak. Never ignore that because God speaks and he begins a movement that way. It's how he works. He does the same thing even on larger scales. When God wants to do a work in a community, he'll choose a family. And he'll begin a work in that family to change an entire community. When God wants to do a work in a city, he'll often begin in a church. He'll call a church to a new level of obedience and a new level of walking with him, believing him, trusting him. And he'll change a city because of what he starts in that church. And when God wants to change the nations, he'll start with one nation. And he'll change them. He'll call them. And then he'll do his work. This is what he did when he chose Israel. He said, I'm going to choose a people, not because they're powerful, rich, mighty, or popular in any way, but I'm going to choose them just because I want to choose them. And I'm going to make them great, and they will be an example to the world of what it looks like when God is the center of their world. And he did that. We read passages in the Old Testament where he gave them his law. He gave them his promise. Genesis 12 says that he spoke to Abram and said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he called them to walk in obedience to him. He said, as long as you walk in my ways, I'll bless you. If you don't walk in my ways, I'm going to bring some consequences into your life. I'll bring some correctives and some directives to get you back in the path. Because I love all nations. But whenever I want to do a work, I'll start with one. So that they will be the icon, the representative, the picture to everybody else of what it looks like to have God at the center and this is what he did. We read the story throughout the Old Testament. And then when he sent his son, they rejected his son. And they faced corrective and directive and greater calling. And then God began a new work because of the hardness of their heart. God called a new group of people. He called those who had received grace by faith in Jesus Christ, and he says, they will be my church, my called out ones. And so now, you and I are the people on the planet 
that God has said, you are the ones I have now called out. And you will be the ones who will show the rest of the world what it looks like to walk in my ways, to know me, to hear my heart, and to have a heart for me. And God uses the church today. But God does the same with the church as he does or did with Israel and is still doing. God does the same with the church as he does in families and does in individuals' lives. When the church gets out of line, God still brings corrective and directives in to bring them back to the place where they can receive him and walk in his ways. Amen? This is a process God uses. And he's so gracious in that process. You know, we, we might walk in disobedience for a time or for a season, and we might think, well, that part of my life is lost, damaged, burned, never to see joy again. But God says, no, I, I bring beauty from ashes. I bring joy where there has been mourning, sadness, because he is the God who restores even what has been lost and stolen from our lives. And so in those places where we have walked in disobedience and you and I do our best to try to forget those things, hide those things, don't tell anybody else about those things, God says, that is the very place I'm actually gonna do my greatest work Because like Lisa stated earlier from Romans 5, where sin abounds, even is growing out of control, grace abounds all the more. Amen. And God is good to restore the places of our greatest pain, the places of our greatest loss, and even time that we have squandered. Today, our message is called, He Restores the Years. Because God restores not just things, He restores years. And I want us to look at a passage of Scripture today, and then you're going to get to hear a real-life story from a couple in our church of how God has done this very thing. He has restored the years. Amen? So turn with me to Joel chapter 2. Joel in the Old Testament. If you're following along in a Bible app, obviously you know how to spell it, J-O-E-L. All right? So find that, find chapter 2. The interesting thing about the book of Joel is we don't have an exact time stamp of when it was written. But we do know it was written, of course, during this Old Testament period. We know it was written to the children of Israel. We also know that it was written at a time when they were in this phase of walking in disobedience. And they had suffered and they were suffering and things were not going well and they were being disobedient to God. They're saying, I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm gonna go my own way. God, we don't need your ways. Your ways are not as cool as the world's ways. We don't get as popular. We don't get as many likes. We don't get as many shares when we walk in your ways, God. So we're gonna walk in their ways. We're gonna do our thing, do what we wanna do. But anytime you walk away from God, he will be faithful with his people to bring some correctives and some directives to get you back into his path. Amen? Not because he's mean, but because he is that loving. Not because he's cruel, but because he's that kind. He wants you to experience his goodness and his grace. So don't count those difficult times of corrective and directives as negatives. Count them as the hand of a loving God bringing you back in line with his heart. Amen? Joel chapter 2. I'm going to do a summary of this chapter here. There's so much we could say, but there's some other story that we've got to tell today. and You're going to love this. But Joel chapter 2, verse 1, starts off with this warning that God gives to the people there because of their sin. It says in verse one, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. That's pretty ominous words to start off with. God writing to, or God speaking to Joel and he pins these words. He says, Joel, here's the deal. I want you to go and I want you to sound an alarm. 
I want you to make it loud and I want you to make it clear and I want it to come from my, my holy mountain, my place. I want the people to know that it's from me. I want them to know with great certainty my love for them, but my sure warning to them because there's, a, there's concern. There's trouble coming. And the way Joel describes it in chapter two is it's coming up here in this, in this next part of the verse. He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. He calls it the day of the Lord. Now sometimes that day of the Lord gets used a different way. Sometimes it's a, it's a pronouncement of good things to come, but this is not the case here in Joel. Joel says there's a day coming. It's the day of the Lord. It's a day of correction that's coming. It's a day to be feared. It's a day that should alarm you. It's a day that should concern you. When you hear the trumpet blast from Zion, when you hear this blast, this warning call, this ought to be of great concern to you. It ought to cause you to stop what you're doing. It ought to cause you to look up. It ought to cause you to evaluate your life and say, something's not right. There's an alarm being sounded. He goes on in verse two. He says, here's what it's going to look like. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. He says, this day that's coming is not a pleasant day. This day that's coming is not one you're going to want to look forward to. This is a day of great correction for the people of God, and it's coming sure, and it's coming quick. You see, when God wants to do that kind of work in a people, the Bible uses a certain word to describe that work. It's the word reproof. It's not a word we use a whole lot in our modern language, but it's a word that means a corrective. It's discipline. And I know as believers living in the New Covenant era, We have been given grace in Jesus Christ, but we have also been given truth in Jesus Christ. And the same God who has shown us mercy and grace is still the same God who corrects his people in love. He will bring reproof. He was doing that for his people here in the book of Joel. And he still does that today in the lives of his children. He will bring a set of correctives into your life, a set of circumstances that are outside your control, a set of circumstances that are not pleasant, a set of circumstances that are designed to get your attention, a set of circumstances that are designed to get you to the place where you say, God, I was trying to do this all on my own and I can't. I yield to you as the God who loves me and has called me. I will do whatever you want me to do. That's what reproof is designed for. Now, Joel's gonna go on and describe this. In chapter one, he did some of that already. He he was gonna bring a very specific corrective. He described it in those verses we saw in terms of dark clouds that were coming, ominous, dark clouds. And when he brings darkness, when he brings suffering, it's designed to get our attention. I think we live in a time today when we are actually seeing reproof happen in America. Our nation began as a Christian nation. Its roots are founded in scripture, in hope, in prayer, and dependence upon God. So I don't have any trouble saying today that the correctives that we are experiencing in our land today have come from a God who's trying to get us back to a place of where we came from. And I don't have any trouble today seeing that when our land is experiencing an increase in crime, an increase in disease, 
an increase in health issues, an increase in emotional and mental illness, an increase in conflict, in tension, in divorce, in financial troubles, in poverty, in rebellion, in murder, in cries to remove all authority, in cries to defund the police. When you see that kind of resistance, when you see that kind of turmoil, when you see all of those kind of troubles coming up on a land, let me tell you, that is God's reproof on our nation. We are watching the hand of God try to get the attention of a people who have turned their backs on God, who have resisted him, who have refused him, who have pushed him aside, who have dismissed the kingdom, dismissed the church, dismissed scripture, dismissed truth, dismissed the spirit of God, dismissed humility in their own lives. We are watching reproof happen in our land today. And it was happening in the day of Joel's day. God was bringing reproof. Here's what God said to the people in verse three. He said, so therefore, rend or tear your heart and not your garments. Don't just put on an outward show of your attempt to be spiritual or religious Do the work of tearing your heart and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Because God is not interested in destruction. God is interested in restoration. Amen? Amen? And so God calls his people to repentance. Our second word for today. God brings reproof so that it might lead to repentance. In other words, change. So that you might live differently than you did before. So that your heart would change. So that your desires would change. So that your ways would change. So that you'd become obedient and humble and kind and diligent and faith-filled and confident in God's ways, listening to God, submitting to God. And that you would change your priorities so that the kingdom would be first, not seeking money. So that your desire to please God more than pleasing people would be first. So that seeking to obey God would be more important than obeying your appetites. So that honoring God with your wealth, not honoring yourself with your wealth would be your goal. So that being conformed to the image of Christ and not to what is most popular would be your desire, that you would seek to build your life around the kingdom first. This is what God was calling his people to then. This is what he's calling us to today, to seek truth and not just your personal feelings. When that kind of repentance happens, when the reproof has done what it was designed to do, And the people repent. God said this to them. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. You see that dark cloud that he mentioned earlier? It wasn't rain clouds. It was locusts. It was grasshoppers. I know here we call locusts those things that make those summer sounds in the trees, cicadas, that kind of thing. But here in the Bible, in this passage, he wasn't talking about those. He was talking about grasshoppers that come in and ravage a land, that destroy the crops. And this had, this had been happening and would happen to these people. He goes on in the next verse and he says, not just the swarming locust, but the crawling locust the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. And locust is used here more in the terms of uh, a swarm. The actual words used here in the original language here in uh, verse 25 refer to more specifically what we might call um, canker worms or inch worms. You know those little inch worms that do that? They come in swarms when they come upon a land and they destroy the vegetation. 
very, very difficult to eliminate. And they'll stay for seasons. And after them came the consuming locusts. The original word here is caterpillar, the moth-like caterpillars. I don't mean caterpillars that produce beautiful monarch butterflies. I mean the destructive caterpillars that produce a destructive moth. They would come and spend seasons and eat the fruit and the leaves. And then the last word used here in the original language for the chewing locust is the word for the palmer worm, which also would destroy the leaves and vegetation in the land. And this would come and wave upon wave of these locusts would come. First the swarming, then the crawling, then the consuming, then the chewing. They were all variants of the original form that God had brought upon the land to cause them to soften their hearts and seek him. Destruction would come, pain would come, loss would come, and God was getting the attention of the people. And he says here in this verse, in verse 25, he said, all that had been lost because of these locusts, all that had been lost in terms of crops and money and the time, the years that were wasted, he says, I will restore those. And you remember, if you've been here, or listen to our messages online, how God restores. God restores in the place where the pain happened. God restores what was lost. And God always restores more than what was lost. And so he's making a promise to his people. If you will turn to me, I will restore to you the years that have been lost. The years that you think, man, I squandered it. I spent all that time on myself. I blew all that money. I don't know how I could ever get that back. And God says, I know you don't, but I do. I know how to restore what has been lost. And this is the hope and the promise for us, even as God's people. When you think it has all been lost. When you think it has all gone. When you think there's no way it could ever be better than it was before. God steps in and says, I will restore if you'll turn to me. So later in that, in that same verse, when Joel writes about the locusts, the consuming locusts, so forth, here's how God refers to them. He says, they are my great army, which I sent among you. Wait, God, you sent all of that? You sent the swarming locust? You sent the consuming locust? You sent those worms? Yes. That is how much I love you. That is is how passionate I am for you to walk in my ways. Don't ever dismiss what God has brought into your life as outside his control. He is the sovereign ruler over all the universe. And he knows how to call for a grasshopper to show up and swarm at the right time in the right place to get a people's attention so that their hearts might be drawn back to him so that he can work through them to show his glory to everyone else. Amen? I'm convinced that's what's happening in our day. This is an attention-getting moment. This is not wasted. This is not outside God's control. This is not just in the hands of man. This is a God-arranged moment that the church and a nation that was once born in him would wake up, would come back to life and have the heart that he's called us to have so we might be used by him to speak to the nations. Amen? Verse 27, God goes on and he gives them the promise. He says, then, here's what'll happen. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel 
I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, my people who will never be put to shame. He said, when you turn to me and I begin to restore all that was lost, then you're going to know with clarity that I am with you. Then you're going to know that I am for you. Then you're going to know my protection because my people will never be put to shame. So we can take great comfort as God's people. Even if difficult days come, like the ones that we are living in. And God is attempting to get the attention of a people. We can know that when we do turn, he will restore what has been lost. God chooses, God directs, God corrects, and God restores. It's the process he uses. This is the restoration story. This is how it happens. God brings Restoration. Now, I'm confident he's doing that today in our land. And I love the fact that even since we began this series here at Vertical, God has begun a process in us of revealing these truths. I know some of the stories. And over the next weeks, you're going to get to hear some of these stories. So let me introduce to you a couple in our church who... Uh, have had this story play out in their life. And, well, I don't want to give too much away. Let me introduce to you Nate and Stephanie. Nate, y'all come on up here. Stephanie, come on up. You've, you've probably seen Stephanie's face at the welcome table as you come in on Sunday mornings. And you might have seen Nate's face if you turned around and looked in the tech booth because he's one of our guys that works in tech. And uh, y'all have been here for how long? Tell me. It's been a little over three years. Okay, three years here at Vertical. And uh, God has worked in their life. So we're going to do a little backstory to set up what has actually taken place just in the last couple of weeks. Last month. The last month. Yeah, just in the last month. Some events have begun to unfold. Events that they had not planned. Events that they did not know were coming. But God is faithful, right? All right. So um, tell us how y'all met to start with. Let's go back in time just a little bit. Okay, so we met in 2009. We were both in Denton, Texas, um, recovering from separate addictions. And we met... um, somewhere along those lines in the recovery process. Um, I thought he was super cute, so I was like, hey. <laughs> you know, I could tell he... Did he have the, this much hair then? Um, about, the same, about the same amount. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, about the same. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we, we just clicked. I worked at a little pizza parlor, and he was just carpet cleaning for a carpet service, and... I remember him walking in with Alex, and Alex at the time was just a baby, and I just remember like almost that sealing the deal. I was like, oh my gosh, this baby is so cute. (laughs) Like, he was so cute. Yeah. So, uh, you're at a recovery um, class, course. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what's life like during that time? What's going on? Well, in the beginning, everything was really, really good. Um, You know, I I got pregnant with Dakota, and we just were kind of like starting our little family, living life. We had moved in um, to an apartment right after we had Dakota. Literally, I think it was like two days after we gave birth. Wow. So um, everything in the beginning was was really well. Um, After Dakota was born... uh, my, I, I'll let him share his, my, my addiction was opiates. Um, after I had a C-section with Dakota, uh, I had already, I, you know, I had been clean for, you know, a very long time, like over maybe a year and a half at that time because it was maybe two years. Um, I was prescribed opiates after my C-section, and although I knew I shouldn't take them, I did, and that started our path on a completely completely different um, course. course. Yeah. Completely. Okay. Nate? 
What, what's going on for you at this time? With me, it was, it was a range of emotions. One, I think, I remember my mom telling me from the time I was five or six years old, what do you want when you grow up? I want a family. That, that, that's all I ever wanted. But I had that. I, I had the opportunity to get that, and I don't know if it was too overwhelming or the stress or not knowing what to do. So my, my drug was amphetamines. So that's what I turned to. Yeah. And we went down the same paths that we had both been trying to separately. get away from. Yeah, separately. Right. Okay. So you're, you're caught in some addictions during this time. Yes. Um, how that kind of... Our addictions were completely separate, and it seemed like if I... When I was good, he wasn't good. When he was good... I wasn't good. Mm -hmm. It just kind of seemed to flip because we, our addictions were very different. Um, they were very different. So, um, oh gosh, um, it was so many ups and downs during those years before we came to Christ. We went through homelessness. Um, we walked miles sometimes just to eat. It was homelessness, separation, like separation several times because we oddly never used together. It was literally always when we weren't with each other that the other one seemed like it was very sad and depressing. So our coping mechanisms weren't, weren't the best. So we went through a pretty much a four year period where we were both struggling to get things right. And, um, Thank you, buddy. Thank you. In that first bout of it, because of the homelessness and us trying to move and trying to figure out how are we going to do this, um, we lost our son in the process. Um, we had asked my dad for assistance, and that turned into us never getting him back. Um, You'll hear the most of the story later. I'm sure I'll, I'll share the whole testimony. But um, it was just a really hard several years. Some days, I don't even know. I shouldn't even be alive. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be happy almost. Is sometimes how I felt back then. Like, uh, this is just me forever. Yeah. I'm sure you recognize the amount of courage it takes to sit up here and do this and tell this kind of story, yeah. And they don't do this to give glory to themselves or to these addictions. The restoration story is coming. This is the painful part of the story where they walked in their own ways. Um, yeah, so... Anything else, Nate? I, I want to get to the part where you both come to Christ, but I want to make sure we've kind of uh, dealt with as much as we need to here at this point. Well, and that was the funny part. Even when we were, we would be thousands of miles away, but when one of us called, the other one was always right there. Wow. Okay. And, you know, it, it, from day one, I knew even when we were in our bad times, if she ever needed me, I'd be there. Okay. No matter what I had to do. So um, we're condensing the story down, but there's a place where you come to Christ, yes. and that changes some things. Talk about that um, for just a moment. I came to Christ a little bit before he did. Um, I, and it's funny that you said that a minute ago. He picks one first because I was thinking, oh, my gosh, he did. Um, I had come back home to Texas in 2015. Um, at that point, my father had had a stroke. So I, was, I started renting out the back house behind his house, to, you know, hopefully mend relationships and that um, I went back to school at the time and I um, completed, I'm a medical assistant. Um, I was just doing everything I could to prove to everybody that I'm here, I'm back, like I'm better, <laughs> like I'm not who I used to be and I don't want to be that person. Um, at the time, Nate was still struggling. He was still out battling his addiction pretty hard. Um, Although we weren't broke up, we um, did not live together. He had his own apartment at the time. 
and I was taking care of my dad. Mm. Um, so I came to Christ a little before that, but I knew, I knew who he was. I knew his kind, sweet soul. I mean, he's a veteran. He, he's a good person. And so I knew all of these things, and I just wasn't willing to give up. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, you may not be good today, but I'll check <laughs> on you again tomorrow. <laughs> How about for you, Nate? And well, as for me, after t- about ten or fifteen years of battling my addiction, it got to the point where I was done. I was tired of waking up like that every morning, and you know, I was ready for the life that I've dreamed about. And you know, I was there when Stephanie came to Christ. I have been raised in the church my entire life. Even in my addiction, the one time that I wasn't in my addiction was Sunday going to church. Mm. So I always knew that was a safe place. And I believe it was the summer of 2016, you know, I was baptized. The mistake I made then is I thought that would make it all go away. So I didn't put in the work that had to be put in, which is why I fell back into my addiction. Mm. And... It was shortly after Hope was born that there was that moment, and I was done. Mm. And it's been a constant struggle, constant battle every day since then. But I'm, I'm good now. I'm good now. Amen. 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 So we fast forward to a month ago, and you're living life. You're working, raising kids. You're attending church. You're learning. You're growing. You're connecting here. You're serving. And uh, it seems like things are headed in a pretty good direction. And then all of a sudden, something happens. Nate, tell us what happens one night. Well, in order to tell that story, I need to go back to when we were homeless. Okay. When we were homeless, I did things that I'm not proud of in order to survive. One of the times I had gotten caught, and this was in Illinois, and I was given two years probation. Um... I did maybe four or five months of that, and then I, had the opp- I got a call for a job here, and I had an opportunity to come home. So I called my probation officer. I asked, hey, can we transfer this down to Texas? I got a job offer, and she said no. Well, at that point, I'm like, well, I'm going, and her response was, don't come back to Illinois. It's, it was a misdemeanor that I got arrested for, so there was non-extraditable, so if I don't go to Illinois, I'll be fine. So that was in 2015, and I was fine. Well, I was dry. I had some errands to do on Wednesday, the 23rd, I believe it was. Just, I, just recently. Yeah, June or July. July 23rd, and I was driving, and I knew my headlight was out. Stephanie and I had just had a conversation two or three days prior, and I told her, "Hey, this Friday, after work, I'm gonna go get my headlight." So I'm driving. I was like, you shouldn't drive. Yeah, and, like and I'm like, oh, I've been doing it for two months now. I'm fine. Well, so I'm driving, and I'm finally that night, I'm like, you know what? I should probably go get a headlight. So I was driving to Walmart. I was at the stop sign, and a cop pulls up right in front of me. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. And he looks at me, looks forward, looks back again. I'm like, <sighs> okay, so I make the turn. Before he even turns his lights on, I'm already pulled over. I've got my hazards on. I'm like, okay. I mean, I was literally on my way to go get a headlight for my car. So, wow. so I go, and they start running my name. And like five minutes passes. I'm like, hmm, that's weird. Okay. Then 10 minutes pass. I'm like, okay. And then about 30 minutes passes. I'm like, oh, great. Mm-hmm. What is going on? So when they walk back out, they come to the driver's side of the car, not the passenger side, the driver's side. So I'm like, I've got a headlight. What are they doing? So they're like, oh, can you get out of the car? So I'm like, okay. The police officer had a a new guy with him. I'm like, maybe he's just training him. Maybe they're going to search the car. I don't have anything to hide. So they do it, and they're like, have you ever been to Sangamon County, Illinois? Oh, man. What is going on? I said, yes, I have a probation violation warrant out of there. But if you look in the notes on my warrant, you will see that it's non-extraditable. I just have to get up there and get it taken care of. And he's like, okay, well, we're on the phone with Illinois right now. 
to see if they're going to confirm the warrant or not. I'm like, all right, cool. At this point, still had 100% faith. They'd be like, no, we're not coming to get him. So then I'm standing out there and I'm talking to uh, the police officer and the dispatch comes back with, well, Illinois is confirming the warrant. At that point, my heart just, it dropped. Um, all my kids' life, I've never missed a day. And Alex will understand, Michael would understand, Hope. Hope would not understand. So that my first response is, how is she going to act? How is she going to react? And so then I start thinking, okay, what now? What now? So as I'm getting arrested, I ask the cop, I'm like, can you please grab the phone from my front seat and call Stephanie? So I called her. I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. Call my boss, put in all my vacation, and we'll see, see what happens. Because I was still processing everything. So they take you on to, to jail that yes. night. Yeah, they, t they took me about 8 o'clock at night, finally. Wow. And how long do you end up staying there? I ended up staying there, n I believe, nine days okay. is what I ended up staying. And even when I was getting booked in, they're like, you'll be out tomorrow. They're like, the, it's a, a misdemeanor, and it would cost more than to come and get you than, yeah. than anything. And so I'm like, worth. all right. Yeah. So nine days are passing. Stephanie, what's going through your mind during this time? Well, honestly, the first couple of days, it was almost like a blur. Like, I, I think I was just crying and hiding so much that, like, I had no energy. I remember walking up to Alex or Mikey and just asking, like, you know, like, have you eaten today? Let me help you. And then, like, the third day, I kind of felt myself starting to get out of it. But what I struggled with the most, I think, was feelings of those lonely feelings of the past. Like, I couldn't believe this was happening. I couldn't believe. I, I will start by saying, I know what we did was wrong. Um, we, we knew what we were doing was wrong. At the time, at the time, that was how we were eating. That was how we were how able we were to surviving. have soap. That's how we were able to do certain things. And so I knew... I knew, but I just kept asking God, why now? Like, why now? And as it's unfolding, we talked, yes. and there was no, no awareness of what was going to happen next. None. And if there was anything, it, the indicator was that they're probably going to come get him. Yes. And this is going to be a very long process. Mm -hmm. And so nine days, now you don't even know what's going on. You probably have less information than Stephanie does. Yeah, I, I, all I knew is that we had hired a lawyer uh, and I had waived my extradition rights. So from that point, they had 10 days to come and get me. Mm. Well, then come to find out on the 10th day, they could ask for another extension. They could do three extensions. So I could have been sitting in there for 30 days before they're like, oh, no, just let him go. Wow. So what's going through your mind as you're sitting there? Your family's at home. Stephanie's taking care of all the kids by herself. You don't know what your future is going to be. What's going on? And honestly, my deep down, no part of me thought that, I, that they were going to come and get me. The part of me that I was worried about was how long am I going to be in here? I'm going to miss the first day of school. I'm going to miss Mikey's birthday. I'm going to miss Mikey's baptism. You know, it's, I know how strong and wonderful Stephanie is, even if she doesn't realize it sometimes. So I knew the kids were going to be okay. Um, I knew I was going to be okay. I also know the stress that the kids put on Stephanie. So <laughs> my main concern was, was Stephanie going to be okay? But then I know her support system. Yeah. So I knew she was going to be okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if you're going to be mad at me for saying this, but I was not the one sitting there, and he sent me a message from there, and it said, you got this. This is our restoration story. I love you. And I read it, and I was like, I'm the one out here. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. Way to go, Nate. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. 
So God's speaking to you during this time, Nate. What's what's that conversation like? Surprisingly, I, when I went to jail, I was in the best place mentally I have been in years. So there was no, oh crap, oh what's going on, what's going to happen? I wasn't looking down on myself like for doing it. It was, I did it. I. This is the consequence. I'm reaping my consequences, but I'm going to be okay. Mm. Um, I knew whether I was going to be gone two years or three more days that when I got home, everything was going to be okay. And, and you're spending a lot of time praying during this, if almost, I remember you telling me. Almost four to five hours a day. Yeah. And the, the first night I prayed when I was in jail, the calmness just washed over me and that's when I knew it was going to be okay wow so then all of a sudden they show up and they say hey Nate we've got some news for you well um I I just got done eating lunch and when you're being released from Ellis County Jail they're like hey you know Jones all the way or roll it up or something so I'm eating lunch I was about to go lay down and I hear Jones, all the way. Hmm. Hey, Jones, all the way. Wait a minute. I'm the only Jones in here. And when they say all the way, that means you're being released, not roll it up, you're getting moved to a different tank, or wow. you're getting... So, you know, at that point, I knew I was going home. Wow. So, you know, I've never moved so fast in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I packed up all my stuff, and I was at the door like, come on, let's, we're, we're wasting time here. And I went down to the booking area, and they are, they're like, here, sign this. And I'm like, okay, what is this? They're like, well, Sangamon County called. The note is in your, in your warrant now. It's not extradition. You have nothing to worry about here. So I'm like, oh, where's the phone? Someone give me a phone. Yeah. So I called up Stephanie, and she was at the Waco Zoo. So I, I call her. Of course. And she's like, what? I can't hear you. So I'm yelling in the phone, come and get me, come and get me. And I guess it cleared up for just one second. She's like, I'm on my way. I was like, Hold on. I hooked up on him. Jamie was with me at the zoo. And I was like, we got to go right now. I was calling Wendy. I was like, go get him. Like, I was so excited. I mean, yeah. I was yeah. so excited. So God made a way yeah. when it didn't look like there was going to be a way. Yeah, he arranged it all. Now, you're still working and getting everything cleared and removed. Correct. But what everybody here may not know is Nate and Stephanie never actually got married. So what's coming? I'm the runaway bride. (laughs) So he proposed to me twice, but at the time... Our life was so crazy, and all I could think is, well, I'm only going to get married one time, and I'm going to make sure it's right. And so in the time where he asked me, it was all wrong, you know? Like we were, somebody was not doing what they needed to do, and so I just was like, okay, even though I thought that I was ready, I'm really not. However, I am now. (laughs) Now, yeah. There you go. So... So I think we've been talking pretty much nonstop since I got out of jail, and I think we're shooting for early spring, so late February, early March, for a wedding. (laughs) I say next week, but she won't go for it. (laughs) I tried to get him to do it right here in the service, right here. Let's just get this thing done. We'll just, we'll see, right? Yeah, we'll see. I'm not opposed to a Sunday morning wedding. Hey, neither am I. Hey, what are you doing doing right now? We'll keep praying. I just want to make sure that I say one more thing, though, about everything that's happened over the last two weeks. And Okay, you know, 10 years ago when all of this stuff was going on, like, I, I was that person. Like, you could have never told me. I mean, I was like, my life is over. I've lost my, my only child at the time nothing's ever going to be good again. And 
although I've struggled to, to accept love throughout the years, this last couple of weeks has, I don't even, can't even put it into words. Like this last couple of weeks has been so amazing. Like I've never felt so loved. And like that is so much for somebody that lived such a hard life for, you know, more years than I'd like to admit. Like that is so meaningful. And I just wish I could stick that into everybody just for like a, a minute because I really feel like if they felt what I felt, they'd be like, aha, like that's, that's it. And I'm just so thankful for everybody in this whole church, my family, my best friends are both here and I'm so excited. Like, I, I just, I'm in awe of all of the acceptance and the, the non-judgment from everybody. It, although I was shaking before, like now that I've been up here and I'm just looking at all of you guys, like I love all of you so much that like I don't even, like I, you know, like it's, I, I'm not as nervous as I thought I was gonna be. So. And what a powerful picture. Remember what I said. God restores in the place of our greatest pain. He restores what was lost or taken from us. And he restores more than what was lost or taken from us. And this is their story. Amen? Yes. 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 So, what also happens in Joel chapter 2 after those verses I read is a promise that comes. It's a promise that says, and it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all your flesh, your sons and your daughters. They shall prophesy. Now, we had scheduled several weeks back for Mikey, their son, to come and be baptized. But when all of this happened, it was on hold. But today, we're going to baptize. And Nate said, can I be the one to baptize him? I said, yes, most definitely. So we are seeing God's hand move. He is restoring all things in the place of the greatest pain. He's restoring in a way greater than anybody could have ever imagined or written a script for. And he is showing the proof in their hearts because now they know the Lord is with them and for them. And he's doing it in their children as well. So is Mikey here in the room now? Is he? Yeah, come on up here, dude. Yeah, come on. You see, because several weeks ago we talked and uh, it was on a Sunday morning, actually. He came over here and we talked for a little bit about what it means to know Jesus and to follow Jesus. And I told you some time back, there was a, there's a move that God's doing in our children of coming to faith and wanting to be baptized. Not one because the other's doing it, because they all came to me individually. And Mikey's one of those. He's young, but I hear in him an understanding of who Jesus is and a desire to want to follow with his life, an understanding of what sin is as much as he can at this age, and a desire to serve Jesus with his life. I'll applaud that and welcome that and celebrate that every day. Amen? Amen, yeah. So, are you ready to be baptized because of what you believe about Jesus and because of what Jesus has done for you? Mm-hmm. All right, amen. All right. <laughs> Also, during that time, um, they mom kept it, kept it a secret because she didn't want me to know because I was going to church camp. But, like, the first day that I came back, she told me. Yeah. And look what God did. I'm sure you're praying for your dad and for your mom. And here you are sitting in his arms today. That's how much God loves us. He can make, he can make what we think can't happen, happen. Amen? All right, let's get back here to some water. Yeah. Yeah, let's come on.
perfect. Well, I'm going to talk and Nate's going to baptize today. Mikey, I am proud of you and glad that God has spoken to you and that you want to love Jesus and follow him with your life. This is where it begins today. You've believed him in your heart and now you're going to follow him with your life. And baptism is a beautiful picture of that. So Mikey, today, your dad gets to baptize you as a picture of what Jesus did because Jesus was buried and he rose again on the third day. And now you're going to be buried in this water and raised up to walk in new life. So Mikey, you're baptized today. Buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Hey, there's more restoration stories coming. I hope you'll be back next Sunday for what God is doing here at Vertical. Amen. If God has done something in your life and it's a story of restoration, come see me. I want to hear it. I want to hear what God is doing. And I want others to hear that story as well. Amen. Hey, we close our services here at Vertical by me saying lift him up and you say live him out because that's what we do. Let's do this. Lift him up and? Amen. We'll see you all next time.